Gordon, are you sure you don't want Molly or one of your children here with you? Dr. Bartle had been my primary care physician for 15 years. I knew from his soft tone and hesitant demeanor that this wasn't a permanent flu or anything like that. I had been losing weight for over a month and was experiencing constant abdominal pain and nausea. The kids were out of the house and successfully pursuing their careers, and Molly was out of town helping her mother deal with her recently deceased grandfather's inheritance. I took a deep breath. No, it's okay. Just tell me. It's bad, Gordon. He sighed and sat up. Pancreatic cancer. I'm so sorry, my friend. I'll be with you every step of the way, but I have some referrals for you to palliative care specialists. People I know and trust. Cancer? No, that's crazy. It was a virus or something. I just felt broken, not whatever it is that people with cancer feel. It was nothing. I just needed vitamins or something. It couldn't be cancer. Maybe, can we take another look? Maybe it was a mistake? I don't feel that bad, do I? I hated the way my voice shook. Gordon, I wish it wasn't. You can get a second opinion if you want, but the result will be the same. This can be cured? I'm afraid not. Not in the way you're thinking of. We can make your life easier, but the survival rates aren't encouraging. For how long? Maybe six months. Can I, can I go to my room for a minute? Sure. I'll come check on you in about five minutes. I'll never see my grandchildren. I won't grow old with Molly by my side. We'll never go on all those adventures we planned for when I retire. I wanted to cry, I tried to cry, but there were no tears. There had to be more, one way or another. I didn't know what exactly there should be more of, but it was weird. When you find out you won't live to see the end of the year, it should be more significant, met with more ceremony. My world was ending, and I could still hear the traffic outside and the music from the speakers. Staring at the wall, I waited for the doctor to return. A knock sounded, then he walked in. Gordon, I can get you an appointment with a colleague this afternoon. She's a therapist and can help you sort this out. Yep, no. Thank you. Maybe tomorrow or the day after. I need to be alone. What am I going to tell Molly? She should be home tonight. Just be honest with her. She needs to know. I couldn't go home. It was impossible to concentrate, and I couldn't let Molly see me like this. Just outside of town was the Embassy Suites Hotel. I felt incredibly tired and wanted to sleep, rest, and just sleep. Pulling into the parking lot, I saw my wife's Jaguar with the distinctive Molly Scat license plate. I never realized before that it could be read as Molly Scat. Parked next to it was an Audi with the license plate Spine Dock. I recognized that car. It belonged to Arnold Frost, a chiropractor who had been Molly's college sweetheart. They'd been engaged before I'd met her, and he'd moved back to town about a year ago. I was numb. There was no heartache or anguish. It was just all too much. Blinking slowly, I couldn't take my eyes off his license plate. I guessed that explained why we'd cooled off in the bedroom over the past six months or so, and why she had to spend so much time with her mother. Molly's attraction had dropped three times in the previous five years, and then picked up again after a few months. Who was before Frost? I hoped I was wrong, that maybe they'd just met for lunch. But in my gut, I knew I was fooling myself. I parked far enough away that I could see their cars but not be seen. The woman I'd loved for more than half my life came out of the side entrance, kissed the man who'd beaten me to her heart, got into her car, and drove off. There was something about it that my brain couldn't understand, some symbol I was too tired to decipher. My sanctuary, my love, my wife had just destroyed me and left. I leaned back in my chair and lay down. Within hours, my doctor had given me a death sentence, and my wife had emotionally hastened my death by six months. Shivering, I woke up. Several hours had passed, and I was covered in cold, clammy sweat. It was dark outside, and my back was stiff from sleeping in the car. It took me a few minutes to get my bearings, and then I went inside and got a room for the night. A repeated knock on the door woke me up and I stumbled in and let the guy who serviced my room in. I couldn't seem to get back to sleep. After eating, I called my daughter Amber. I needed to hear her voice. It was pathetic, but I needed to talk to someone who I was sure loved me, and it didn't matter what we talked about. We talked on the phone for 45 minutes, talking about everything and nothing. When I said goodbye, she paused. Daddy, is everything okay? 
You're saying, I don't know, just, are you okay? I remembered Girl Scout projects, soccer games, and father-daughter dances. I lay on the bed, staring at the ceiling as we talked, and the realization hit me again that there would be no miniature Amber for me to spoil, no granddaughter to take to Disney or watch her grow up. Trying to keep my voice normal, I replied. Of course, sweetie. It's okay. I'll call again in a few days, okay? We hung up and I was about to call my son, but I couldn't find the strength. Still dressed, I curled up and fell asleep again. Woke up around 10 p.m., drank the water that came with my lunch and texted Molly. Had to leave town. McMillan is threatening to fold his business. Dead zone for cell phones. Can't make a call. I'll be back in a few days. I checked it out just for fun. She hadn't called or texted me in the four hours I was supposed to be home. I could have been dead in a ditch if she didn't care. I watched a little ESPN and went back to bed at one o'clock in the morning. For the first time in a long time, I woke up rested and hungry. I ordered scrambled eggs, bacon, pancakes, and orange juice, went to my car and got my laptop. While I ate, I started making lists. I owned Riley's Ally. My wife's name didn't appear anywhere, and she held no position or stake in the company. My grandfather started the business, my mother took over, and when my parents were killed by a drunk driver 10 years ago, I took her place. Sheila Riley, my mother, spearheaded the merger between Riley Accounting Services and Allied Financial, our largest competitor. Shortly thereafter, Molly became more materialistic. It happened slowly at first. We needed a house in a better school district. That made sense, but we didn't need shaped topiaries, fake chandeliers, or couches no one was allowed to sit on. It needed a bigger car to take the kids to and from classes. It didn't have to be a Range Rover. Eventually, the pretense stopped. Molly wanted all the goods in life and assumed we could afford them. That didn't bother anyone, not me, not the kids. In fact, we could afford almost everything, and although she was fixated on status symbols, she was still the same loving woman we had always known. We let her have her status symbols while we ourselves continued to live the way we had always lived. For most of the children's lives, she was the perfect mother. She gave up a promising career to stay at home, and if sacrifices were required, Molly and I made them. We went without new clothes for a few extra months so the kids would always be well-dressed. We gave up vacation trips so the kids could drive to school. There was never a complaint on her lips. These were our children and that is what you do. As our wealth grew, so did her sense of self-worth and importance. In the last few years, it was as if she felt entitled to make up for the sacrifices we had made in the past. Unfortunately, it wasn't just about finances. In the last few years, she began to sideline us, spending more and more time alone and getting annoyed when anyone pointed out that she was missing family events or seemed uninterested. The children were left to their own devices and battled dragons in their own areas. Molly thwarted all attempts to get together on long weekends and vacations. I even offered to fly with the kids a few times, and she tried to convince me not to at least half the time. I bought them plane tickets anyway, and what little time she carved out for her family was reluctantly spent. I wondered what she'd been doing all this time, but it became clear when I pulled into the parking lot. After finishing half of my glass of juice, I started typing. Get a third-party valuation of the company. Sell the company. Sell the house. Cash out everything of value. Get rid of the money. Leave her nothing. Hospice for the underprivileged. Prepare the children. Block her out of my life. My life. Well, that was a joke, wasn't it? I picked up my phone and made the first call of the day. Craig? Gordon here, how's it going? Good, how are you doing yourself? Shook that bug out yet? Yeah, I went to the doctor yesterday. Listen, I need two favors. I need a recommendation from a firm that can estimate the value of the company, and I need you to keep this to yourself. Scott Billings sold his brokerage company a few years ago. Do you keep in touch with him? Like the people he used? Craig and I were golf buddies for almost 20 years. We both worked in the financial sector, and our relationship was both personal and professional. Scott was a mutual friend of ours. He went through a devastating breakup and divorce, and his ex-wife attempted suicide. She ended up moving to California, and he left right after he ruined her career. I heard he's back in town. Maybe he and Craig have been in touch. Either way, Craig would find me someone good by the end of the day. Then I called my doctor back. I needed to know exactly what would happen to me when I was unable to function 
and how I could best prepare to face the end alone. He gave me the names and phone numbers of the specialists he recommended, but insisted on making the appointment himself. That, that's very kind, Doc, but I can handle it. You don't know my schedule, and... Gordon, listen to me. Your schedule doesn't matter anymore. It's your priority now. If I have to take time off and drive you or have Eileen drive you, I'll do it. Eileen was his wife. They were friends who had been to this house many times. It didn't bother me that this man was trying so hard for me while my wife hadn't bothered to call, text, or email in almost 24 hours. Okay. Thank you. That means a lot. I had to pause for a moment before continuing. I won't need a therapist, but please contact me about the others. Next, I called my receptionist. Carla, I'll be out of the office for a week or so. You know who to contact. The auditors are coming over in the next couple days to check everything out. Everything's fine. I'll contact you tomorrow with their names and other information. You can reach me on my cell phone. Call me if you have any problems. You can't run a business like mine and not have security on staff. Most of our internal employees who kept watch were pencil pushers rather than tough Sam Spade types. I reached out to our outside company. They filled in the gaps where our employees were not up to par. They had several divisions. They needed someone to handle plain vanilla adultery cases. It wasn't for me. I didn't need to build a case. Divorcing someone when you're going to die in six months would be a ridiculous undertaking. I needed proof for the kid so I wouldn't be made out to be the villain. The strange energy I was filled with prompted me to meet with representatives of the firm in person. I had the CEO's personal number and could have handled everything over the phone, but I was being pushed by some drive and nervousness I didn't understand. As I drove, I realized that with Molly in my hands, I had something I could influence and shape. As I approached the receptionist's desk, I pulled out my business card and held it out to the woman. Gordon Cordell to see Avery Beisel. Do you have an appointment? I shook my head. I'm afraid not. I hope you can spare five minutes for me. Please have a seat, Mr. Cordell. I'll get him on the phone. Ten minutes later, Avery himself came down and ushered me into the well-furnished meeting room. It's a pleasure, Gordon. What can we do for you? I'm afraid it's not a pleasure for me. I need you to provide me with as much information as you can about how my wife is abusing me. I need proof of what she's doing now and information about who she was with before her current boyfriend. He sat stunned. I took some strange pleasure in the fact that he felt uncomfortable. It was clearly the last thing he'd expected. Well, of course. I'm sorry to hear of your difficulties. I signed papers that seemed like a whole tree, giving them authorization for everything except the colonoscopy. The cars were put in my name, as was the house. They would both be hooked up. Her finances would be looked into, as would this crook's, as far as it was legal. Avery hinted that they had connections to most of the hotels in the area and could apply a little pressure to get copies of the records. Avery, I need that information as soon as possible. Don't spare any money, okay? If you need to get more people involved, do it. All right, Gordon. We'll make it a priority. I hope you're wrong. I'm not wrong. He merely pursed his lips and nodded at me. Anyway, I was out of there in an hour. Craig called me back when I was still in the Avery parking lot. Gordon, I have someone for you to evaluate. Marquette Financial Services. I've spoken to Maddie Albright. She's the CEO, except in name, and no, she's not related to Madeline Albright. Can you meet with her at 3 o'clock? Yes, of course. Are they nice? The very best. They are near 25th and 96th. I'll send you the address. Thanks, Craig. I owe you one. Mrs. Albright radiated professionalism. We sat and talked for about 45 minutes, and I signed another stack of papers. She said they would start evaluating my company the next day. She had pictures of her family on her desk. Her husband appeared to be a doctor, and they had two children. I envied their future. Hopefully it would be longer than the one I had. I insisted on the need for speed, and she told me that if I preferred speed over quality, I should find someone else to do the evaluation. In retrospect, that was a great response. It had been a productive day and I drove back to the hotel to relax and maybe take a nap. On the way, I thought about how much was depending on me and how good it was that I had something concrete to contend with. My death was coming. It seemed inevitable, and there was no plan, no strategy, 
no means to keep the Grim Reaper from getting around. I had absolutely no control over my own death. But with Molly? Yes, I could control her all I wanted. Picking up the phone, I leaned back on the bed, dialed the number, and waited for the automated voice. Thank you for calling the PFC James Dunn Veterans Clinic. If this is an emergency, please hang up and call 911. We are located at 4,776 Eagle Ridge Circle in Pueblo. If you know your caller's four-digit extension number, please enter it now. If not, please wait for an operator. After entering the number, I waited for her to pick up. Doctor? Gruel's office, may I help you? Hi, Marlene, this is Gordon. Is he in? A patient just came out. Give me a minute to see if he's available, Mr. Cordell. Gordon's fine, Mar. She'd already paused me. I'd talked to this woman twice a week for years, and I was still Mr. Cordell. Sighing, I began to wait. My friend's voice came on the line. Gordon, what can I do for you? I, Ecom, need help. Your help? I'll clear my schedule. Do you want to come over tonight? No, I... Look, why don't we just go out to dinner or something, and we'll talk there? Sure. Chile Verde and a beer? Betty's Bar and Grill at 7? That'll work. Thanks, Ecom. Gordon, if... If you need me this afternoon, I'll reschedule. No, my friend. Seven is fine. Thank you. He wasn't hard to spot when he walked in. There aren't many Sikhs in Pueblo. I waved him over and he came over and sat across from me. The waitress came over almost immediately with chips, salsa, and two glasses of water. Do you need some time or are you ready to order? I smiled to myself. Yes, I needed some time. Maybe more like six months? I'd settle for a few years, but that wasn't on the menu. She was a pretty girl, probably in college. Do you have any beers from Avery Brewing Company? She nodded. Great. I'll take Uncle Jacob's stout and my friend will take O'Doul's. We'll need two bowls of chile verde, one vegetarian, and garlic bread. Thank you. She took our order and left. Ecom looked at me, rested his hands on his chin, and squinted his eyes. Ordering for me? How romantic. Shut up. You order the same thing every time. We were quiet for a minute, and I looked around the restaurant. There was definitely a young atmosphere here, and I was pretty sure we were the two oldest men here. Ecom must have noticed something when I looked at the couples with families. He paused for a moment and just watched me. Talk to me, Gordon. What's going on? You know how it is when someone gets a flat tire, is late for a meeting, and then spills coffee on their shirt? They come home with some version of what a day I've had. Now I'm pretty sure my day yesterday is in the Hall of Fame category. Okay, what happened? I told him. About the cancer. About what I'd learned about Molly. About the weird ennui and emotional exhaustion and everything else I could remember. Then I explained how I woke up with a greater sense of purpose than I could remember in months. I knew he wouldn't be happy with my decision, but I was going to destroy her. There was some kind of synergy to it. I was going to die, and Molly was going to regret her death. Saying I'm sorry sounds pathetic, doesn't it, Gordon? But it is. You don't deserve it. Let's just talk tonight, okay? As friends. But I want you to come over on Saturday and we'll start planning something. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Dr. Ecom Gruel was a psychiatrist who worked at the Veterans Hospital and treated fellow service members. We met during the service. There weren't many of us from Pueblo, and we became fast friends. He was a dozen years older than me, but that never interfered with our friendship. I was probably one of the few people who knew he had a bronze star. There's going to be some kind of fair in the parking lot on Saturday. Just stop by and have someone behind the counter call me. Sounds good. We ate, drank, talked about our kids, and he tried to distract me for a few hours. When are you coming back? Her first attempt at communication in almost two days. Bitch. She probably wanted to know how free her schedule was so she could continue to have fun with the chiropractor. I ignored the message and called my office instead. Carla, I have a file on my computer called CBO. I need you to email me the contents of it. Okay. You'll have it in ten minutes. Anything else? No. Is everything okay in there? Yes, sir. Your department heads are doing a good job.
Everything is running smoothly. Good. Call me if you need to. The folder was a compilation of buyout offers I'd received over the years. It contained company biographies and general reviews I'd done. After looking through the file for an hour or so, I did a little digging online to make sure the information about the companies was still current. I drafted an email letting them know I was interested in receiving proposals and inviting a third party to do an evaluation. After customizing each email, I sent them Maddie Albright's company information so they could do their due diligence. Then I called my doctor back. His receptionist put me on pause, and he picked up a few minutes later. Gordon, I sent you the information on palliative care specialists. Did you receive it? Got it, thank you. That's a different matter altogether. Look, under no circumstances is Molly to know anything about my condition. I'm not joking about it. We're friends, Jim, and I value that friendship, but there's no way out of this. I'm telling you as a patient, I expect complete confidentiality. If I need to get a lawyer involved, I'll do it. That's, look, your wishes will be honored, but I have to tell you that I think you're making a huge mistake. It's my mistake, Doc. I'm grateful for the direction. By the time Saturday came around, I had liquidated most of my assets. We still had cars, a business, a house, and a vacation condo in Honolulu. I had a huge chunk of cash, and we hadn't even gotten to the big purchases yet. I texted Molly and told her I'd be back on Wednesday. She responded with a simple, okay, how sweet. This was the same loving wife I had managed to hate over the past week. Dressed in casual clothes, I drove to the military clinic to see Akam. Half of the parking lot was taken up by some sort of festival for veterans, and I looked around before heading to my appointment. There was live music, representatives from companies and charities providing services to veterans, and vendors handing out free food to those who had served. When I saw the sign Mookie's House of Tacos, I wondered where the missing E was and why they were using an extra apostrophe. The vendors all had tip jars for non-veteran customers, and I tipped big for the mango lassi at the samosa place. Listening to something called the Poplin Family Jug Band, I watched Mookie at work. He had a huge sign announcing that he didn't sell Dr. Pepper and a smaller sign that listed his tacos and salsa. Every once in a while, he hugged those who approached and handed them a brown paper bag. These are veterans. He supplies them with weed. He says it's some super strain, but almost every vendor in Colorado has been saying the same thing since 2012. But Mookie is the real deal. He gives it to them for free. He's partial to vets and old people. You're a friend of Dr. Gruel's, right? Looking at the guard, I held out my hand and we shook it. Yes, Gordon. Nice to meet you. Try the tacos, Gordon. They're surprisingly good. After buying six of them, I let one of the Mookie's employees convince me to buy some of their hemp salsa. I bought two cans of red and two cans of tomatillo. When he looked back, I gave Mookie's a thumbs up and put 200 in the tip jar. I'd have to get rid of millions, and I might as well start with someone who takes care of veterans and old people. Two chicken and one carnitas for me and two sofritas and one bean for Ecom. I feared he would have to air out his office if we were delayed. Taking two waters for a 10-buck tip each, I headed toward the building. Halfway there, someone called my name. Gordon. Turning around, I saw Scott Billings jogging in my direction. Shifting the bags into my left hand, I held out my right. He looked good. I'd heard rumors that he'd fallen apart after his divorce and had lost a lot of weight. Presumably, he was traveling, trying to find a way out of a mental crisis. I suddenly developed a great deal of sympathy for him. Hey, Scott! It's good to see you. Are you back in town already, or are you just visiting? Yeah, I'm back. Bought a new apartment and everything. Thought it was about time. My niece and nephew are growing up. I wanted to be with them for a while until they go off to college, you know? What about you? What do you do? I'm selling the company. Maybe we can have lunch sometime and you can tell me what you've learned? Yeah, sure. He handed me his business card. Give me a call. If I have plans, I'll clear my schedule. Are you here for the fair? No, a friend of mine works here. Just stop by to say hello. What about you? Yeah, sort of. Have you ever met Liz Armaguito? The lawyer? We're kind of dating. Her niece is Shannon Poplin of the Poplin Family Jug Band. Shannon and her dad do a lot of benefit concerts, and we're here to support them. I won't stop you from chatting with your friend, but it was good to see you. 
Give me a call. Sure. It was good to see you too. Seeing Scott reminded me of Nancy, his ex-former LPGA star. I hadn't thought of her in years and decided to Google her when I got back to the hotel. Akam seemed happy to see me, but that might have been due in part to the fact that I had brought food. We talked for two hours and got into the kind of deep shit I'd have a hard time discussing with anyone else. So, Gordon, it's time to get down to business. For most of your marriage, Molly has been a wonderful wife and mother, right? Now is the time in your life when you need her most. Why not talk to her? Give her the opportunity to change course and be with you in the time you have left. If she seizes this opportunity, you win. She will regain her reality, realize what she has been doing and how it affects the people she loves, and you will gain a woman you love who will be with you for the rest of your time. If she refuses, you have lost nothing. You're back in the position you're in now. I stared at the floor for a full minute, then picked up my water bottle and took a sip. That's not going to happen. I, I just can't. The thought of going to bed and knowing that the next day I'll be with the woman who did this to me and our children, and she's with me now because I'm dying? No, I can't do that. I sighed and looked him in the eye. I'm going to burn everything to the ground and let her live in the smoldering ruins of what was once our life. Leaning back in his chair, he looked me in the eye. Poetic wording, I guess. Silly, but poetic. So you plan to find strength in your hatred? Do you really think that's a healthy approach? Smiling, I replied. How healthy does it have to be? We don't have to worry about long-term consequences, do we? I'll be in my grave in six months. My friend, forget about reconciliation for now. You don't need to spend time with her. I can talk to you about coping methods. I can warn you about what's in store for you emotionally. I can be there for you as a friend. But the best thing I can do for you is to advise you to find peace. Talk to her. Let her know what is going on and let her know that you are aware of what she has been doing. Lay it all out and see how she reacts. I think we both knew I was going to ignore that suggestion. I appreciate your advice, Ekam. But what about the children? How do I prepare them? We talked until it got dark, and by the time I got back to the hotel, I was exhausted. I ordered two bottles of water and two beers for the room and made the call I had been dreading. Hey, William, it's Dad. He laughed. Even though I don't recognize your voice, your name comes up on the phone. What's up, Dad? Missing you. You and your sister. Listen, if I send you a ticket, can you fly down and meet me at your sister's next weekend? I need to talk to you. Yeah, sure. I don't think I have anything going on. Is everything okay? Sure. Sure. Everything's fine. Daddy, it doesn't look like everything's fine. What aren't you telling me? I need to talk to you both about some business matters. I just have a lot on my mind. I'll send you the ticket information, okay? Yeah, sure. Dad? I love you. You can call and talk whenever you want, you know that, right? I know, I love you too. You and your sister are the best thing in my life. Have a good night, William. Hanging up the phone, I lay back down and stared at the ceiling. He was a great kid. At least once a week, I thought William was going to break his neck. Even as a kid, he rode his bike like a maniac. Then he got into skateboarding, and I used to take him to skate parks and make him wear a helmet and face shields. I would have preferred to put industrial bubble wrap over his whole body, but I took what I could get. He was a man now. After another 20 minutes of self-pity, I decided to make some videos offering him any advice he could replicate at crucial moments in his life. How to tell if a woman is the one? Actually, any advice I could offer in this area would be suspect. How to overcome the first hurdles in marriage. What to do about the panic when you find out you're going to be a father. My kids and a few close friends were all I cared about. I had less than six months to do my best for them, and I was going to use that time wisely. I would consider an irrevocable trust for the kids that Molly couldn't touch. If that proved unfeasible, I would simply buy as much gold as I could and send it to them in three years. What can Molly do if her lawyer sends me threatening letters? Unless Charon carries mail, the postal service won't be able to get them to where I'll be. Screw her. Maybe I was just deluded, but I thought I had so much anger built up inside me that no harm would come to me. The investigators sent me daily photo summaries. Up until now, I had ignored them, but here I opened the emails and then the attachments. The anger didn't help. The written summaries were dry and clinical. The photos felt like they were digging into my soul. 
There was no bravado or unnecessary anger in them. There was only a sense of incalculable loss. I didn't realize I was crying until I felt the tears rolling down my cheeks. After stripping down to my underwear, I climbed under the covers and fell fast asleep. The morning didn't bring me as much energy as the previous few days had. Still, I had a purpose, and that spurred me on. Sitting in front of my laptop, I went through 20 or 30 options before I came to something I was happy with. Hugs. Nothing free gives so much to another person. Give one today. It had to be something unabashedly silly and sweet. I wasn't a creative person, but it seemed fitting. The University of Colorado supposedly had a good art program. Parking on campus, I asked a few students where the graphic artists had classes and headed that way. Stopping at each bulletin board, I found seven ads from students looking for freelance work. Some had little tabs to tear off at the bottom of the sheet with email and phone numbers, but I just took a picture of each ad with my phone. Satisfied that I had accomplished this task so quickly, I walked into the sandwich store on campus. The line was long but moved quickly. After approaching the cashier and not fully reading the menu, I asked the young man, Do you have the turkey and avocado wrap? Of course we do. Bacon and tomato? Yes, of course. Bacon and tofu? Tearing my gaze away from the pictures and menus on the signs above his head, I looked up at him and smiled. I'll take the real thing and add more bacon, okay? And mayo. Lots of mayo. Your funeral, dude. I even laughed. That's not what's going to kill me, son. Grabbing the juice for my wrap, I paid him off, put a 20 in the tip jar, and went to find a bench. While I ate, I composed my letter, looked at the pictures for different addresses, and sent it off. Hola, compadres. I would like to hire you for an art project. Please let me know your rates. If the price is reasonable, you are hired. I don't need to see samples. If I like your work, you will get a second order within a week. I need a collage of people hugging. It needs to show all possible variations. Older people hugging with younger people. Disabled people hugging athletes. Bikers and hippies. Men and men, women and men, women and women. Go crazy. This should be useful and scalable. This is going to be a billboard. Here's the text that should be in the center. Hugs. Nothing free gives so much to another person. Give one today. By the time I got to the ad agency leasing billboard space in my desired neighborhood, I had price offers from five out of seven. I agreed to the price of each offer. I had to haggle a bit, but I got three of the four billboards I needed. By the time I finished the meeting, the last two offers came in. I accepted both offers. Requiring quick turnaround, I received six samples for approval the next day. I approved them all and paid them 50% more than they asked for. What the hell, they were college students and I needed to get rid of the money. The ones I liked the best called back to their creators and ordered another image. This one was a little different. Two days later, I sat in the parking lot, eating chocolate chip cookies and drinking cold milk. I was nostalgic for the foods I enjoyed as a kid, and there wasn't much point in being overly concerned about my diet. They came around pretty quickly. My ad appeared on the billboard less than two hours later. They had a crew of four and a supervisor. When they were done, I got out of the car and approached one of them. Hey, you guys did it pretty fast. I always thought installing a thing like this was a big project. The short, wiry man looked me over from head to toe before answering. No, it's not a big deal. They come in strips. Keep them straight and the monkey can handle it. I think you're being modest. Look, I'd like to ask a few questions about how this works. I'll give you $500 for your time. When we finished talking and he called a few people he was working with, we made a deal. $2,000 per person and $2,500 for myself, and I had a team to post whatever I wanted. The graphics company gave me 24 hours to prepare if I was willing to pay extra. I did. My loving wife texted me twice, letting me know she was home and asking where I was. I didn't respond. If she called the kids and they called me, I would have to explain over the phone what I wanted to explain in person. I was counting on her indifference. 48 hours later, the new billboard was installed. We worked through the night. Okay, they got the job done, and I gleefully watched them. We were three blocks from his office. The new billboard had a picture of a chiropractor kissing my wife. Below the photo was a line of text. Dr. Arnold Frost is my wife's chiropractor. He treats more than just her back. 
The site was set up and supposedly could not be traced back to me. I didn't really care. The whole dying thing was very freeing. It took longer than I expected, but after lunch I got a call. Mr. Cordell, this is Fred Banks from Sunrise Advertising. There's been an incident with one of your billboards. Feigning indignation, I demanded to know what he was going to do. He assured me that the new image would be removed by that evening, and my original image would be restored. Two days later, the process was repeated on my other billboard, which was two blocks from his office. They were very apologetic about it. Eventually, they apparently realized that the woman was my wife and terminated the contract after the third billboard was replaced. My receptionist called and said she was getting a call from a law firm looking for me. It seems Dr. Frost was having some difficulties in the community. I guess he wanted to sue me or something. It was all over social media, and the local news covered the story repeatedly. Website traffic was at an all-time high. Molly called and wrote repeatedly. How wonderful it was to have her undivided attention again. The huge posh house in the best neighborhood with the best school that my wife needed to feel better about herself belonged to my parents. After buying a condo in Miami and another in San Francisco, they scaled back and bought a third here in Pueblo. They sold me the house for next to nothing. It was all in my name and I took out a huge mortgage. It was supposed to take a month to do everything, but I had a month, no problems. My meeting with the kids was on Saturday, and on Friday I met Scott Billings for dinner. I was hoping to blow his mind about selling his company. We worked in the same field and his advice would come in handy. He brought along a woman he was dating, which came as a surprise to me. When I stood up to shake his hand, he reached out and gave me a hug. That was another surprise. We had never been that close. Our relationship had always been reduced to seeing each other at professional events, charity dinners, the occasional poker game, and at the driving range where we chatted while practicing our strokes. So do you talk to anyone, Gordon? Am I? You mean about selling? He looked at Liz, the woman he was with, and then back at me. No. You realize everyone knows, right? The billboards and everything? Are you seeing a counselor or something? Oh. Yeah. I guess I should have thought about that. I've been kind of isolated lately. No. I don't talk to anyone about it. Well, actually, sort of, but not specifically about it. Giving me a sad smile, he continued. Okay. You can think about it. Did you get a chance to meet Liz? Pueblo isn't such a big town and we all go in the same circles. No, not really. We may have met in passing once or twice. Liz Armagito, right? Gordon Cordell, nice to meet you. She had a firm handshake and her reputation went before her. When she swam, sharks would get out of her way. She was a strong lawyer, and if I ever needed an assassin, I'd try to get her on my side. She smiled at me. Gordon, it looks like the chiropractor is out to get your head. There are rumors of ethics charges. His partners want him out of his holistic practice, and I'm sure patients are leaving in droves. He's going to try to sue you for everything you have. You've got to be kidding me. You put this together in three days? She continued. Everybody knows everybody in Pueblo. Look, you pay for dinner, and I'll count that as my fee. Let me shake some trees and see what falls out of them. I'll work cheap. You get me for free, but you cover the cost of my investigators or whoever else I have to hire. Deal? I, Liz, I know who you are and how much you should charge. I'm a stranger. Why are you doing this for me? Losing her smile, she replied. The cards on the table? I had a chance to step in and help my brother-in-law, but I didn't. He ended up in a complete mess, and I let other commitments to hold me back. I've regretted it ever since. And you're not a stranger. You're Scott's friend, and that's good enough for me. Besides, Frost seems like a scumbag. By the end of the evening, I told them about my diagnosis. Liz's brother-in-law had an aunt who worked as a private nurse and licensed dietitian. She promised to give me her contact information. Neither of us discussed that by the end of my life, I would likely need constant care. The next day, it took me a little over an hour to drive to my daughter's house. She had moved to the neighborhood last year, and I was glad to have her close by. When I arrived, William was already there. As I pulled up to the house, I sat in the car and stared at the house, gathering my strength and courage. The last thing I wanted to do was hurt my children, but I saw no way out. I had to tell them that I was dying and that my wife was cheating on me. Honestly, after finding out that Liz and Scott knew, 
I realized it was pretty obvious at that point and wondered if the kids knew. Amber only had to watch the local news to know that her mother was a slut. Taking a deep breath, I grabbed my laptop and got out of the car, determined to do everything I could to make Amber and William's lives as easy as possible. Amber met her brother at the airport, and they were both already waiting for her. After a solemn hug, I sat them down and began. This is... I'm really sorry you have to deal with this. No child should be involved in something like this. Amber took her hands from the table and placed them in her lap, leaning forward. Dad, what's going on? Okay, two things. One worse than the other. Your mother? Holy shit. I can't even say those words. If I could only shield you from that, I would. I paused for a moment. Your mother cheated on me. She's dating the guy she was with before we got together. He's a chiropractor and moved back to town about a year ago. I'm not sure if they believed me or didn't want to believe me, but I could see them contradicting each other. They wanted to support me and sympathize with me, but they still doubted. They were dispelled when I showed them the text of the investigators' reports. Amber wanted to see the photos, but William absolutely did not. He watched his sister while she looked at the photos, hoping to find something to hold on to, some small chance that this was all a big mistake. When she started crying, he realized, they both knew, and I wish like hell they didn't have to. I hugged Amber for a few minutes. She quickly pulled herself together. What are you going to do, Daddy? Does she know that you know? Are you going to try and work things out? Are you, you, are you leaning toward divorce? There's not going to be a divorce. I think it's a good time to bring up the second, I don't know, situations. I'm really sorry to dump all this on you like this. I'm hell, okay, I'm not going to be here much longer. I'm dying. Cancer. I got about six months left. I found out just before I found out about your mother. The same day. Things went downhill quickly. When they found out about Molly, they cried and were angry, but that paled in comparison to the news of the cancer. They had the same reaction I did. There must be a mistake somewhere. I must get a second opinion. There must be some kind of treatment and the other gamut of denial. Focusing on Ecom's advice, I spoke calmly and acknowledged the authenticity of their reactions. They had many untenable suggestions, and I gently advised them to postpone any discussion until they had time to digest the news. There were more tears, and William looked particularly upset. He wasn't good with words when it came to emotions. He never had been. I assumed Amber would call and yell at her mother, but William would probably handle everything in silence, internally going through his emotions and never discussing the situation with Molly. After an hour or so, he went out on the porch with his beer and stared off into the distance alone. We left him alone for a while. When he came back, I saw that he had been crying. William came over, hugged me, hugged his sister, and got another beer. In a way, he had lost both of his parents today. Look, I know this isn't much consolation, but I still have some time. I want to take you two out to the best restaurant in Colorado Springs tonight. Amber, can you find a place and make a reservation? If it's okay with you... I'm going to crash in your guest room. I'll get up around five and we'll have dinner. Sure, Dad. There's fresh linens on the bed and an extra blanket in the closet. Great. Thanks. If your mom calls, I'd appreciate it if you didn't mention I was here. Oh, and you can check the local news channels. Go to their websites and type chiropractor and billboard into a search engine. Listening to their quiet voices, I quickly fell asleep. Announcement. Daddy, wake up, okay? I felt Amber's hand on my cheek and slowly opened my eyes. I was tired as hell. Clearing my head, I yawned and then half mumbled. Honey, my wallets are on the bureau. Why don't we postpone the restaurant until tomorrow? Order something, take out, whatever you want, my treat. She looked like she was about to start crying again. Dad, it's half past ten. You've slept for over seven hours. And you're burning up all over. Can we take you to the hospital? Should we call someone? Taking her hand from my cheek, I kissed her palm. I'm sorry, sweetheart. I'm just tired. Really tired. I'll feel better tomorrow. Where's your brother? Raising her eyebrows, she looked past me. Turning over, I saw William sitting in a rocking chair watching me. He's been there for four hours. Are you sure the fever isn't interfering? They come and go. It's all right. I'll just go to bed. We'll go out for a big breakfast and make a day of it. Okay. She leaned over and kissed my forehead. 
I... Amber started crying again. I love you, Daddy. I love you too, sweetie. Soon I was asleep again. The vigor I'd felt lately, that boost of energy and lust for life was gone. I woke up exhausted, but determined not to show it in front of the kids. We went to the cafeteria for breakfast, and I made two runs but ate almost nothing. Although physically I felt worse, emotionally I felt much better. I had my kids. I was using them, and it bothered me. I felt like a ghoul feeding off of others. Their energy fueled me, but I could see what it was costing them. Grabbing my laptop and coffee, I walked out onto the porch of Amber's house. I decided I couldn't put it off any longer. It was time to deal with friends and distant relatives. Ever since I'd found out about Molly, I'd withdrawn and narrowed my focus. Unless it was about my business, my kids, or my relationship with her and Frost, I ignored them. Texts were deleted unread, emails were ignored, and phone calls went unanswered. When I opened my email client, I found I had 274 unread emails, and that's after the spam filter. All emails from Molly were deleted immediately. When I was about to delete her 23rd email, I instead clicked the options button and blocked her address. It was nice, but petty. I didn't mind the pettiness. Anything that was general enough, I got a response that I drafted and cut and pasted. It included a summary of what Molly was doing, a confirmation that yes, I had hard evidence, and my diagnosis. I explained that while their concern was appreciated and that I loved them all, I needed to spend as much time as possible with Amber and William. Emails from close friends and people I truly cared about were answered with specific questions. It took hours to go through everything. That night, the kids and I went to the best restaurant in Colorado Springs. We had a great time, but sad pauses and quiet moments of reflection were inevitable. William flew home on Monday and I stayed with Amber for a few more days. I looked for an apartment and checked it out online. I signed a one-year lease and moved in the following weekend. Whatever Liz had done, it must have scared the hell out of Frost and his lawyers. They stopped getting me served and I never heard from them again. She introduced me to her brother-in-law's Aunt Beth and I hired her within the hour. I felt comfortable with Beth. She was an older woman who had been a private nurse for decades. She knew what to expect, and I didn't have to worry about preparing her. Closer to the 30-day deadline, I received a letter of intent to purchase the company, and the mortgage was finalized. I began to recognize the flight attendants by name. Flights to Williams became weekly. He would give me a key to his apartment, I would stay for a day or two, and the next week he would fly to Pueblo. I had lunch with Scott and Liz a few times and even went to a Poplin family jug band concert with them. It was nice, but I wouldn't go again. My days were filled with friends and a few cousins who flew in to see me. Everyone wanted to see me. They were actually saying goodbye to me. We all knew it, but no one said it. There were tears and shared memories, hugs, pats on the back, and assurances that they would look after Amber and William. I grew weaker and weaker and soon found myself on painkillers. I had three supports my two children, and Ecom. I clung to them, and their doors were always open. Unlike them, my doors for Molly were always closed. I changed my phone number, made sure I was never followed, and my children refused to message her or give her my contact information. I kept up the payments on the new mortgage, but they stopped when I was run into the ground. She was surviving, but barely. Her mother had money and sheltered her. Carla, my public relations assistant, informed me that Molly stopped by her house every day for two weeks and stalked her in the parking lot. I was afraid she would do to me what I had done to her and hire a private investigator. After seeing her at my favorite bookstore and two restaurants, I was worried. She didn't notice me, but that couldn't go on forever. While the kids steadfastly refused to talk about Molly and what she was up to, Ecom had no such compulsions. Gordon, she's been in my office half a dozen times and twice at my house. If your goal was to punish her, then bravo, goal accomplished. She's a wreck. I actually referred her to a co-worker. I am gravely concerned about her health. That's unfortunate. I'm sorry, I know it sounds clinical, unemotional, I guess, but I'm serious. You shouldn't be dragged into this. I don't think I've thought this through. The kids were pretty much expected, but the fact that they haven't said anything to her about me isn't too bad. I doubt they even talk to her much. I didn't expect it to affect my friends. So you'll consider talking to her? Hell no. Really? Ecom, my position hasn't changed one bit. His eyes narrowed and he leaned forward. Look, what if it was an ironclad guarantee for once? 
We could do it here in my office and I could act as a buffer of sorts. It would allow you to calm down a bit and maybe take some of the pressure off William and Amber. It's pretty low of me to use them in this way, but it would really help your children if you had some closure to all of this. You've been married to Molly for a quarter century now, and like it or not, she and the kids will still be here when you're gone. If it might help your children to have someone in their lives to love them when you're gone, don't you want to consider that option? Wow. Yeah, you're right, that was pretty low. Powerful, but low. Okay. I'll think about it for the kids. I smiled and shook my head. Using my kids, Ecom. Gee. He only smiled and shrugged. Even though I'd paid her up front for a year's maintenance, I didn't plan on using Beth until I had to. I clung to my independence and any semblance of normalcy with a desperation that sometimes scared me. Unfortunately, as the pain worsened and the dosages increased accordingly, it became increasingly difficult to drive. My nurse became my driver. Beth drove me to La Forchetta de Masi where I was having dinner with my children. She dropped me off and then went shopping, most likely for her nephew's children. They were like grandchildren to her, and she talked about them incessantly. Among them was her teenage grandniece, Shannon, who Beth said was a brilliant violinist, and two little boys, one four years old and the other a baby. By the time I arrived, William and Amber were already seated at the table. We were enjoying a great meal and talking about their careers. By the time dessert arrived on the table, I was ready to bring up Eckham's concerns. I want to ask you guys something, and please be honest with me. Does the fact that I don't talk to your mother make it harder for you? Amber set her fork aside and answered, No, not really. She calls once a week, but she knows I'll hang up on her if she makes a move to contact you. She still tries, but not often. Okay. We both sat and waited. When he finally looked up from his dessert and saw us looking at him, William took a sip of coffee and shrugged. It doesn't matter to me in the slightest. I haven't talked to her and I'm not going to. She can't harass me or pressure me in any way. Is she still stalking you? Yes. I had to change parishes. She hasn't been to Mass in, I don't know, five or six years? She was there this week. I was suddenly exhausted again, but more emotionally than physically. We were their parents. We were supposed to ease their burden, not add to it. You, I sighed. With me gone, will you two have a hard time finding a way to move on with her? Would it help if I contacted her? Once again, Amber was the first to answer. I don't think so, Dad. If Mom and I want to get back what we had, it's going to take some time. A very long time. It's definitely not going to happen in the next few months, no matter what you do. Moving his plate to the center of the table, William leaned toward her. I can't believe that selfish bitch is the mother I grew up with. You've made it clear you don't want to see her. She can't even give you that. You're dying and she still wants it. Screw her. He pulled out his wallet, left enough money on the table to pay for our dinner plus tip, and walked out. We found him on the paving stone surrounding the small pond outside the restaurant. William was just sitting there looking at the water. Are you okay, son? Startled, he lifted his head. Yeah. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm just upset. She cut herself out of our lives completely, and now she wants to come back before time runs out? It's always about her. Beth came back for me and I hugged the kids before getting in the car. Whether she drove or not, she was still my nurse. You look a little pale. Are you feeling okay? Physically? Not too bad. I'm sorry, Gordon. I wish things were easier. Thanks, Beth. Me too. I paid off any debts my kids might have had, bought William a house near his condominium, and Amber got an investment property. They will get a lot more after the sale. Funds were set up for the education of future grandchildren, and I paid off the education loans for Eckham's children. The picture in my mind was like one of those markers they put up at telethons. The little red line creeps upward as new contributions come in, and they make progress toward their goal. For me, it was the opposite. I needed to get rid of every dollar so Molly wouldn't get anything. It consumed me and kept me moving forward. I envisioned my marker. It started at the top and I slowly spent it down, down, down. The money was stored in her account, utilities and other house expenses were paid, and she had no reason to suspect that when I was gone, the money would disappear too. After answering hundreds of emails letting people know I was dying, she should have been aware. 
Or maybe she didn't care. Maybe she was still having fun with her first love. I doubt it, but it was possible. I could have investigated and found out exactly what she was doing, but imagining her pain was far more interesting than finding out the reality of the situation. By the time 60 days had passed, the accelerated sale of the company had taken place. I gave everyone large bonuses and included a stipulation in the purchase agreement that they would keep their jobs for 24 months. They kept everything running while I was the virtually absentee owner. As we approached the three-month mark, Beth moved in with me. I went to palliative care specialists and refused any options that might extend my life a few more months at the cost of losing the meaningful time I had left while I was still me. From time to time, Beth would state that she needed to bring her grandnephews over so she could babysit. We both knew she was lying. She could see how much I would light up when they were in the apartment. The first time they arrived, Ethan brought a toy dump truck. He and I sat on the floor and played for hours. I mostly watched, remembering when William was a kid, but I would put things in the truck when I was told to do so. Ethan was a very feisty kid, but also very kind. His aunt let him have three cookies and a glass of milk every afternoon. She clearly loved the boys to bits. Ethan didn't eat his until I had three cookies too, and his brother had two. He got one less because he was little. That seemed like a valid point. The next week, he told me with great enthusiasm about the addition to his family. They got a dog they named Captain Thor because the boys couldn't decide who their favorite superhero was. That's what Ethan claimed anyway. Personally, I thought he just liked the name Captain Thor. It had an undeniable pathos to it. A few days later, I called Amber. Hey, honey. I want you to think about this and not just answer right away. Have you ever thought about getting a dog? Maybe in three months or so? Daddy, what did you do? His name is Sparky. I was told his name should be Iron Hulk, but I like Sparky better. He's a purebred litter and the smartest dog you'll ever meet. He won't be any trouble and I'll make sure you eat dog food for the rest of your life. She sighed. Dad, what kind of purebred amalgamation is that? Okay, he's a mongrel. I bought him at Paws for Life on Pueblo Avenue. I'll send you a video. You'll love him. If you love him, I'm sure I will. You just... I heard her cry softly. Then she pulled herself together. A dog is great, Daddy. Maybe I'll take my lunch tomorrow after work and go meet Iron Sparky Hulk. That would be great. You two will be best friends. Okay. Dad, I love you. You... Never mind. I'll see you tomorrow. I filmed Sparky on my phone, making him sit up and roll over. I sent the video and a few pictures to Amber and Ecom. He thought getting a dog was a great idea. To be honest, Beth was fine with it too, although she cleaned up after him and took him out for walks. No matter where we tucked him in for the night, I'd wake up and find Sparky half lying on the pillow next to me and staring, waiting for me to open my eyes. As wonderful as that was, immediately after the first incident, I rushed to Amazon in search of dog treats that help with halitosis. I wasn't wrong. Amber immediately fell in love with Sparky. I was almost afraid she would try to drag him home with her that night. As time went on, the situation became more and more complicated. I was saddened, frustrated, and scared, but at the same time I felt a strange peace. Ecom played a huge part in this. He joined me when I went to talk to the priest. I half expected my friend to lead the priest into a conversation about forgiveness, but he didn't. The sign of a true friend is to be there for you when you need it most. Ecom was there for me day in and day out. He was probably the most decent person I had ever met. And when I prayed, which was more and more often lately, I often thanked God for having Ecom in my life. Country-style music was not to my liking. I could admire the skills of my nephew and grandniece Beth, but the Poplin family jug band will never be something I enjoy listening to. On the other hand, Shannon Poplin's classical playing was amazing. Beth and I went to several of her concerts and I would close my eyes and just immerse myself in the music. There was no anger at Molly, no fear of the afterlife, no awe at the growing pain. There was just ecstatic music that lifted and carried me from the first to the last note. Shannon and her father performed mostly benefit concerts as a juggling group. They asked for royalties when they were not performing for a charitable organization, and the recipient was always the Greater Pueblo Wish Fulfillment Foundation. I asked Beth if she could invite Shannon and her brothers the next time the boys came to visit. Beth kept the boys busy while I talked to the 15-year-old. I think it's no secret that I'm not going to stick around. 
I really admire what you and your father are doing. Your Aunt Beth is always talking about your gigs at nursing homes, children's hospitals, the VFW, and other places. Do you plan to continue doing that for the foreseeable future? She paused for a moment before answering. Yes, yes, Mr. Cordell. I'm not sure we'll ever stop. I hope not. Smiling, I continued. You can call me Gordon. I know I look like shit, but in my head I don't feel like an old man. I'm not big on formalities. I'd like to make a donation to the Make-A-Wish Foundation if you would agree to play at my funeral and possibly a wake or memorial service. Shannon, you have a gift. That doesn't diminish your hard work. I'm sure you've spent countless hours honing your craft, but... I shook my head. I don't know how to put it into words. When I've been to your concerts, I stop worrying. I'm not scared anymore, and the music just... Everything bad disappears for a while. You have no idea how much that means to me. She was oddly shy for someone who was performing in front of thousands of people. Shannon didn't say anything back, so I continued. I'll give them $150,000 as an honorarium. Will that work? It sure worked for me. I'd help kids in need and reduce the amount of money that could end up in Molly's hands. Shannon stared at me and then just cried. I felt awful. Should I give her a hug? Should I pat her back? Should I bring her tissues? I was sure that somewhere in the world, there was a guy in his 50s who knew how to handle a crying 15-year-old girl. I'm not that guy. Screw it. I was dying. I had the right to take the cheap and easy route. Beth. I handed the cases to her aunt and played with the boys while Shannon picked herself up. When I left the room, Sparky was lying on the couch trying to lick her face. Shannon hugged me as her dad picked up his kids. Beth sat across from me on the couch. That was really nice of you. I'm not talking about the money, although that wasn't unreasonable either. Shannon hears compliments about her game all the time, but I think they're already flying in one ear and out the other. To hear what her game really means to you, though, really touched her. She understands the importance of what you asked her to do. Ethan and Shannon often play at veteran services. She's a sensitive young woman. Well, a young woman, I guess. Playing for the grieving is not something she enjoys, but she gets it. She really understands. Shannon was very touched. You're a good man, Gordon. I was uncomfortable with the praise. It was always like this. Well, okay. Thank you. I just... whatever. Mentally, I could see that this revered fundraising figure continued to decline. I had set up a college fund for Shannon and her brother's college tuition and an annuity for Beth, which she would begin receiving the 1st of January after my death. But no matter how much I spent, the sale of the company pushed that mark up. I had to figure out how to make sure the kids got it instead of Molly. I could practically hear the disappointment in Ekam's voice, even though the voice was in my head. Well, imaginary Ecom, get over it. I was going to leave her penniless. For years, all she cared about was material possessions. Let's see how well she does without it. Maybe the back-cracking frost could support her in the style she was used to. After consulting with friends who knew a lot about money, I devised an insanely convoluted plan. I hired law firms in London, New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago. Each firm was responsible for making sure the shipments went to my children after my death. Each firm handled a specific shipment, and none of them started less than five years after my death. They received gold coins, artwork, and stamp collections. They could sell what they wanted, when they wanted. Did I lose a significant amount of capital in doing so? Yes. But did I not care? No. If my plan had worked, they would have been wealthy for life. If it worked partially, they'd be comfortable. If Molly found a way to thwart my plans and nothing worked, I'd come back to haunt her. Ghosts, Molly. Was having fun with your ex-boyfriend worth the ghosts? Most of the friends Molly and I had as a couple had dumped her. She managed to convince the few remaining ones to call and ask for a meeting. She was expected to agree to whatever terms I set. She was distraught, wouldn't eat, wouldn't leave the house, and I didn't care. To hell with her. They were more compassionate than I was and seemed genuinely worried that she was in danger of hurting herself. I told them that if I could control the parameters, I'd give her half an hour. After buying a new pay-as-you-go phone at Walmart, I texted her a time and place. We were to meet at the bench at the cemetery where I was going to be buried. She immediately sent a text back agreeing and thanking me. It was a cold, rainy day, and it made me happy to think of her sitting there in the gray expanse, 
surrounded by reminders of death and mourning. I never made it. That evening I sent her a text. I'm sorry. Got taken to the hospital. Lots of blood in the urine. The cancer may have spread to her kidneys. Should I try again at the end of the week? She answered quickly. Uh, sure. Whatever's convenient for you. I'm sorry to hear that. Let me know when and where. A few days later, I arranged to meet at the playground where we had often taken the kids decades earlier. Two hours after I was supposed to be there, I sent another text. Fell asleep in the car. I don't think I can drive. I can call an Uber. Are you still there? No. I'm home. I can come back. How long does it take to get there? Maybe I'll just sleep. I don't feel so good. Is Friday possible? Yes. Friday is good. LMK when where? The location was the same, but the Italian restaurant where I proposed to her was now an Indian place. I made an appointment for lunch. An hour after I was supposed to be there, I sent a message. Sorry, abducted by aliens. I'm still being investigated. Would next Monday work? She hasn't responded. The original estimate of my truncated life expectancy was just that, an estimate. If it was accurate, I had less than 90 days left. No one else was more amused than me that, even without chemotherapy, I was still losing my hair. Beth said something about nutrients and medication. Never mind. I stopped being vain a long time ago. I lost a lot of weight and never seemed to have an appetite. There was a good period when I reached my ideal weight for the first time in years, but I quickly dropped below that mark and struggled to stabilize the loss. My daughter started bringing me marijuana. Brownies, gummies, joints, and anything else she could think of would come into my apartment. It helped with my appetite and numbed the pain. Sleeping 14 hours a night didn't fit into my plans to maximize the time I had left, but I had no choice. I dreamt about Molly constantly. I would jumble memories and Christmas and Disney would merge into one, or both kids' birthdays would be celebrated together. My wife was always there, always by my side. I could feel her body as she snuggled against me, watching William gleefully open a gift or Amber sitting mesmerized in front of the TV watching The Incredibles for the millionth time. The faint whisper of Molly's perfume came to me as I slowly woke up and came out of my dreams. And the first thing I saw was a pair of warm brown eyes looking at me with unquestioning love as I bathed in hot, stinky dog breath. I had $1738,456 left. It was hard not to dwell on the end of my life, but when I was able to be objective, it became clear that I had been blessed for a very long time. My parents, although they were taken too soon, loved me. They inherited money and a thriving business and then took it to the next level. I inherited even more money and took the company to the next level. We always had enough of everything. Enough food, enough comforts, enough love, and enough of everything else that provided us with an idyllic life. There were times when we wanted more. More time, more money, and maybe even more children might have made our lives a little richer, but it wouldn't be fair to say we ever really suffered. The end was near, and I spent my last years as a wealthy man with wonderful friends and two children whom I adored. Molly ended up on the wrong side of the ledger in the final tally of my life, but I would be ungrateful if I didn't take everything I had into account. After talking to the right people in the government, I purchased a huge house near the Woking Sticks estate. It had been on the market for sale for several years and eventually went into foreclosure. The owners started renovating the house and turning it into housing for students at nearby Colorado State University, but they ran out of money. I paid to have the renovations completed as quickly as possible. Monitoring the progress of the work and necessary meetings took up all my time. When we were two months away from completion, William started taking every Monday or Friday off and flew in for three-day weekends. He helped us tremendously when we were interviewing candidates for the position of caregiver for Dr. Eckham Gruel's Veterans Home. We found someone who seemed perfect for us. Fred Schlott was himself a veteran and a widower. An energetic man of 52, he had a background in social work and was dedicated to his fellow veterans. I paid his salary four years in advance and put it into a trust to be administered by William and Amber. The costs of the house would be ongoing, and I shamelessly reached out to old friends and colleagues coaxing them to pledge support. The homelessness crisis had always bothered me, and the fact that veterans were so disproportionately affected was a black mark on the soul of our country. It took the contractors four weeks, but I was still around when they finished the job. Mobility was a problem, as was power, but I toured the house and stayed for the after party. 
The Poplin family jug band was playing and I pretended to enjoy the music. Everything was fine until we got ready to leave. We needed the publicity in the local media to get the attention that would bring support in the future and to let everyone know what was going on. As I got up from my wheelchair to get into the car, I saw Molly watching us from across the street. She looked just awful. Letting the car take my puny weight, I leaned against it and stared at her. Neither of us said a word, and after a minute or two, I got in the car and asked Beth to drive me home. I couldn't escape the thought of my silent wife looking at me, tears streaming down her face. My doctors had backup careers in Vegas running the odds if they were ever needed. Their predictions hit exactly the right target. The six-month forecast was two weeks away, and I felt like I was close to the end. Amber was living in the guest room, and William had taken a vacation and was sleeping on the couch. Ethan and his brother sent videos but never stopped by again. I heard violin playing from my room and was pretty sure Shannon was in the apartment and playing, but it could have been dreams or medication. Iron Sparky Hulk couldn't fit in the wheelchair with me and whimpered until I was moved to the couch. He would lean on the edge and put his head in my lap. With my hand on his head, he would bury his head in the blankets I now used all the time and stay there for hours. Staying awake for long periods of time was nearly impossible and it was hard to concentrate, but I wasn't a stupid person. I noticed Amber's behavior and watched as Beth would take Sparky out for a walk and then return, only to have him want to go outside again an hour later, as if the previous walk had only been 100 yards. Coincidentally, the distance from the door to the parking lot was about 100 yards. Both my sister and my daughter would often look out the front window and then talk to each other so I couldn't hear. This happened at least three times a day as we neared the end, and it got on my nerves. William never participated in their entertainment, so I waited until he went to get groceries before talking to Amber and Benedict Beth Arnold. If she agrees to do what I say and leave as soon as we're done, you can let her in for a few minutes. The look of shock on their faces made me wish I'd had the strength to laugh. Neither of them would make a good poker player. You two are as elusive as vegan activists at a barbecue. Go after her, but make sure she understands the restrictions. Amber, she headed for the door but stopped and looked back at me. I'm depending on you. If she doesn't do what I ask her to do, I need you to walk her to the door. Right now, I don't have enough strength to do it myself. I need your help. If you think you can't, I understand. But this stops right here and now. No, I'll make sure she understands. I'll make sure she does. It's more than she deserves. Amber returned about five minutes later, alone. She's outside the door trying to stop crying and, I don't know. Dad, she's, she's in a really bad place. I'm not saying you don't have the right, but try not to be too cruel, okay? There was a light knock on the door, and then it slowly swung open. She wouldn't have liked that description, but Molly looked shabby. She had lost as much weight as I had. Her hair looked disheveled and unwashed, and her clothes were hanging off her. Hi, Molly. Long time no see. Gore, she stopped and coughed. Gordon, I'm sure Amber's told you, but I'm going to lay down some ground rules. If you don't agree to them, Amber will escort you out, and the Iron Hulk will tear you apart. He looked up at me, and his tail started thumping against the edge of the couch when I said his name. Damn kids with their treats? Your name is Sparky. His name is Iron Hulk? What's wrong with Iron Hulk? It's a good name for a loyal dog, as opposed to a disloyal bitch. Gordon, I want, no, I need to. I stopped her. Hold on. Let's establish ground rules. I don't want to hear how sorry you are. I don't want to hear why. I don't want to hear anything about your affair or your first and, I assume, last love. If you ever mention Frost, how bad you feel, any regrets, it's over. Understand? He wasn't. What's the matter with you? What did I just say? It was a mistake. Get out, Molly. No, no, I'm sorry. I won't say a word. I'm sorry. Turning back to the wall, I sighed, stroked Sparky, and continued. Not much matters anymore, Molly. Most of what used to matter is now useless. I don't need confirmation or denial, but I'm guessing that some part of who you were before you became a selfish bitch still exists and that part wants some kind of forgiveness. I can't offer it right now. If it helps, I'll try. Really, I'll try, in this life or the next. I paused again. My anger and drive were overwhelmed by fatigue, and I felt a migraine coming on. 
If you want to be worthy of forgiveness, do what you can for your children. I don't care how often they reject you, hurt you, or push you away. Deal with it. I'm not just talking about your cheating. You've been a shitty wife and mother for years. Remember what you were like when they were little? Be like that when you're a grandmother. I won't be there, Molly. You'll have to be there for both of us. She was crying and I was close to doing the same. I started to feel nauseous. Looking her over from head to toe, I was amazed at how much she had aged in such a short time. Okay, we're done here. You can get back to the vigil or whatever the hell it is you do. Turning, she went to the door. Opening it, she looked at me again. I love you, Gordon. You'll never know how sorry I am. If it brings you any comfort, know that even if you find a way to forgive me, I won't be able to forgive myself. She walked out the door, and that was the last time I saw my wife. I was strangely pleased. We tend to think of ourselves in the present tense, but my death allowed me to see my life in its entirety. It had been a good life, and even the last six months had been good. Ecom sat in the corner and prayed. Amber and William stood next to the bed, my daughter holding my hand. Iron Sparky the Hulk lay beside me. My breathing was shallow and intermittent, but I felt no pain. I said a final prayer for my friends and family. Smiling, I heard the sounds of a violin and a whispering voice as I took my last breath. I wasn't sure who it was, but I think it was Amber. I couldn't think of better last words. I love you. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.